Pull that up and give it to Jesus with all of your heart. Come on, ladies, with everything in us, every breath. Oh, come on. Lord, we love you, and we love you every clap, every beat of our heart, everything we've got in us, Jesus. One more time, honey. Lift it up, Jesus. It's yours. Beautiful, beautiful. Come on, oh, we love you. We love you. We love you. God, your breath, your life, your everything to us, Jesus. Just lift both hands straight in the air, Lord, how? How we worship you. You, 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 God, you're everything, you're everything. Every eye looks at you, Jesus. The reason of our life, the reason we can live and move and have our being, Jesus. Lord, we give you glory and honor. You're beautiful and you're wonderful. We are in awe of what you do, God, and who you are. Thank you that we can, we can just be a part of your heart. Thank you that with our little yeses, you just take our lives, and Lord, thank you for what only you can do, Jesus. You bring good out of all of it, out of all of it, out of all of it. Lord, thank you that you do that. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We love who you are, Jesus. We love who you are, Jesus. We love who you are, Jesus. We love who you are. Come on, you tell him. Isn't he something? Hasn't he been good to you? Aren't you thankful he's been so faithful to you? Oh, we just thank you, God. We just thank you, God. Thank you, God. You're doing it, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, what we, you will do. Thank you, God, for what we understand and what we don't understand, God. We can thank you even in what we don't understand because you're above it all and you've got it all and you're working in all of it God you're above it all you're above it all you're above you win every time God you win in what we know and you win in what we don't know because we can trust you above it all Jesus to God be the glory and I give him one more hand clap of praise will you do that uh. You may be seated. Well, I, you know, I don't even get weepy very much, but Jasmine and Lisa have me. I'm just all, oh, I want to just go sit and cry for a little while. <laughs> oh, Jesus. How are you? Are you good? Has, it, has this already been incredible this weekend? Aren't you just so blessed? Last night would have been worth your trip, right? Yes. God is so here in this room. And uh, I sense his glorious presence. You know, I can always tell when I've been in a room, uh, when I come into a room where people have been praying. And you just sense his presence. So you intercessors that have been praying and fasting before this conference, paid in full. He's already answering your prayers right now. You've, it's, it's work. It's working. And uh, I, I really, I don't even know what to say about what they have just said. I'm going to take it home and and just go sit and cry somewhere because <laughs> um, it, it is true that Rusty and Lisa have known each other 83 years. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it, you know, the truth is I had not even connected that it's 40 years, Lisa. Oh, dear God. <laughs> and it just hit me. How long have We've been here. Um, how, long, how old am I? I mean, <laughs> and uh, everything she said is true, plus way more that we cannot tell. I mean, I was, what, early 20s. I was in my early 20s, just had my oldest daughter, Lauren. So, yes, in that van, we were traveling. I had just gone on the road on my own and, and was singing, had a band, and so Rusty and Lisa both sang. And uh, they were just falling in love. In that, and so we were all in this van, band, backup singers, like she said, luggage. And I had, since I just had Lauren and car seats, were to, car seats weren't yet a thing, isn't that terrible? But it's true. And you know it. You did the same thing. You breastfed while you drove. Y'all did the same thing I did. You didn't tell anybody. How many of you did that? Raise your hand. See, me too. And I, Pam looks at me like, Karen, you did it. I did. But don't say, don't ever tell that. But anyway, I had a little bassinet. Remember those bassinets? 
And remember, I squeezed that bassinet between the two front seats to keep my baby in. I can't believe I did that, but she's alive. God had mercy. He protected us. He had mercy on our ignorance. And I would never do that now if you just, that, that makes you feel better. Everybody who thinks that's awful. I'm grateful for what these people have been in my life way back then, all through the middle, and now. And the sweetness of God. He, some people he puts in your life so that you can run together and finish together and finish strong together. And Rusty and Lisa have been that to me. And, and their family, their children are like my children. And now their grandchildren we're sharing. We're going to raise these grandbabies now to love Jesus. And Jasmine, it's an honor to meet you, sweet girl. Where are, where's Jasmine? I'm trying to find her. There she is. And um, what an, I've, some people you meet and you just feel like it is that instant connection. And uh, you are that. I haven't gotten to hear you preach yet, but I was, I meant to be here last night. I couldn't come. Some things came up. I wasn't able to come, but I'm going to hear you preach. And so, and I think the rest of the world is going to hear you preach from what I understand. So I'm excited about this young generation that God is now raising up and uh, to fill the shoes and of those that will be moving on. So thank God for you, Jasmine. Thank God for you, Rock Church, and the Church of North Alabama, and uh, Tennessee, and from every area that you have come here from. Praise God for what he is doing in our world right now, and uh, what he's doing in your life. How many of you come in here have come in here this weekend believing for something only God can do? I want to see your hand. I want to see your hand good. Believing, I'm standing in this room today, and only God can do this. Good. You're just so in the right place. Number one, God's here. And number two, you've got a lot of sisters in this room that are going to join with you in agreement. And I believe that even while you're here in this room this morning, God's working on that thing wherever it is. Amen. And I believe that even before you can get home, things can be different. Do you believe that? When I came to this, when I came to the Flourish Conference about 10 years ago, I guess it was now, I told Elise, I told Lisa a while ago before we came out. I received a word, and I just want to release it to somebody in this room, because I received a word 10 years ago in, in her women's conference that I hung, hung on to, I clung to, I declared, I prayed, and I saw it fulfilled. And the word was this. God said this. I can do in a moment what would have taken 20 years of counseling. So can I just throw that out there for anybody that needs that word this morning? Whether it's for your marriage, whether it's for your child, whether it's for your own understanding. God says, I can do in a moment what would have taken 20 years of counseling. Say restoration. God can bring restoration that quick. And I'm an eyewitness to it. When we were singing that song a while ago, I sought the Lord and he answered. Let me be a witness to you today to tell you God keeps his promises. I sought the Lord and God answered my prayer. Let me stand here and encourage you today to keep standing and fighting. I'm living proof, just one of many that can tell you, you keep praying because God's going to answer your prayer. Sweetheart, you keep on praying because God's going to answer your prayer. You hang on. You keep believing. You keep fighting. You keep standing. Don't you dare give up. God is going to answer your prayers. She's coming home. He's coming home. God can do it. Nothing's too hard for God. You just got to keep believing it. Shout hallelujah. Shout I believe it. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Glory to God. All right. Before I get started, do I have any front porch friends here? I just wondered. I love my front porch friends. Wave at me. I love them. They know it. We're best friends. We are. You can be a front porch friend too. All you got to do is just join me on Facebook. And we come together every week as intercessors. And encourage each other, share our prayer needs together. Just follow me on Facebook and join me every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Central Time or any time thereafter. And we just, we just pray together and God answers prayer. 
have a word in my heart. I really feel an assignment to share. Can I do that right now quickly? All right. Lord, I acknowledge I've got to have you, Holy Ghost. Help me deliver this word, Lord. Let it be what you want it to be and give us ears to hear what you are saying, Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, I pray that, Lord. Help me, God. Amen. All right. This is the message that is burning in me right now more than, quite frankly, any other at the moment. Um, you know, the truth is, now let me say this. I, I'm going to go kind of big picture a little bit. We're going to talk about really big picture things, even just global issues, all the way right down. Just going to bring this right into your house for what you're believing for. So we're going to cover a lot of space today. Because you cannot come in a room like this and, um, and, and it, as glorious as it is to just come together and put ourselves in these walls and worship God, uh, which is very important that we do and be strengthened and encouraged in that. That's why we have come. We need each other and we need that. But it's, you just simply cannot ignore the issues that are happening outside these walls. I'm 63 this month. September 30th, 63 this month. And in all of my 63 years, and I think there's some ladies here in my generation, my, my uh, age range, and we can all say together, we've never seen times like this. We know that. Something is going on. It's not, these are not normal times, right? We kind of always thought that, but no, now we, now we know that. And things are changing fast. There's something going on so significant that we would be foolish to ignore it. You can sense it. You can sense it all the time. You can sense it. You can sense it in the air. You can hear it in pretty much any conversation you have with anybody. I don't care if it's just someone you don't even know. I'm saying by people on the plane the last two or three weeks in, in different places I've gone to. People, complete strangers, and complete strangers are talking about what's going on. You can watch it on any news media platform that you turn the television on to or pick up your phone to look at. There's something going on, and everybody's wondering sort of what's happening. It's... And for you and me, I to be told, we've always talked, you know, and heard about kind of wars as being something far away and, and in, the, in our history. But now that you're looking and you're going, whoa, wars and rumors of wars that kind of seem a little too real, close, concerning. Wars and rumors of wars you hear. Um, it's, it's like for real wickedness in high places. Uh, men's hearts felling them for fear. And it seems reminiscent of words that we've heard here, right? And, and signs to notice and look for. So whenever I look around, one of the things that's concerning to me too is how that the world itself is looking for answers but in all the wrong places. Because the issues of our nation and, and our world these are not issues that can be solved by the wisest of men in all of their debate because this is not a political war. This is not a cultural war. This is a spiritual war. And we have to know that and recognize it because most certainly the world does not. But this is a spiritual war between light and darkness, truth and a lie, and just simply put, between God and the devil. Actually, probably between the devil and God's people, because God has already won this war, hasn't he? I was thinking about this this past week a lot. Uh, the last few days, I was reading the word, actually. Let me just turn and flip it over there. This word really stuck out to me as like a voice early in the morning, and if you were to ask me, what is one word that you feel like best describes, if you could just put in one word, that literally this moment that we're in, not, not the big, big, but 
just this moment that we're in, Karen, as a nation and as a church within the global picture. What is, Karen, is just one word that you think kind of would summarize the moment? You know what, what word I feel like that word would be? Perhaps. Perhaps. Another way to put that word would be, who knows? <laughs> you know where I found it? When I was reading Joel 2 the other day. Joel chapter 2 verse 1, sound the alarm in Jerusalem and raise the battle cry on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. Verse 12, that is why the Lord says, the Lord says, turn to me now while there is still time. While there is still time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief. Tear your heart instead. Return to the Lord. Return to the Lord your God. Watch. Excuse me. Return to the Lord your God. Watch. For he is merciful and compassionate. I love this. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. Who knows? Perhaps he will give you a reprieve and send you a blessing instead of this curse. Who knows? Perhaps. Such an interesting moment there because this was written, Israel has sinned and judgment is barreling down on them. It's about, I mean, it's just in a moment that it looks like it's just heading headlong straight toward, toward Israel, toward Jerusalem. And what happens is the Lord comes in with just a little sliver of hope. It's like, it's like the Spirit of God just comes in and says, wait a minute. Return to me. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. Give me your heart. Come back to me. Who knows? Perhaps he will give a blessing instead of a curse. So much, it appears to me in this verse, are y'all listening? It appears to me in this passage that everything is hinging on what they do with his call to repentance. Everything for a nation is hinging on the response of God's people with that call to repentance. That's huge. So while the world is looking around to see what will happen, the world is looking around to see what's going to happen, I believe heaven is looking down to see what's going to happen. Because everything is hinging again on a response from us, from the Spirit of God, calling the people of God, come, come to me, repent, pray. Who knows? Perhaps. God can send a blessing instead of a curse. Second Chronicles 16.9 says this. It says that the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro across the whole earth looking for someone, anyone, he can show himself mighty through. What is that? It's, it's in those perhaps moments. Now, here's the interesting thing about perhaps moments. They are just windows of opportunity. Please hear me what I'm telling you. Perhaps moments are only little windows. They don't last very long. Do you hear me? Perhaps, when you hit a perhaps moment, it's just this little window of opportunity that God gives you before everything changes. 
And believe me, if there's not the right response, you can read it for yourself. It's not a good picture. Because the wages of sin is death. And it's the law of God. And nobody's going to change that. The only hope for, for a nation that has turned its back on God is a people within that nation who will answer that call and repent while there's still time. Do you understand that? It's interesting because every generation really has to answer that call for their generation. And in 1949, the searching eyes of God found someone he could show himself mighty through. And I have sort of heard about them through the years. I've never looked into their story until lately. And it kind of more this year, I began to ponder. I'm still looking into it. I'd always heard of the Hebrides revival. How many of you have heard of the Hebrides revival? How many of you have heard of that? Okay. How many of you have never heard of the Hebrides revival? Don't even know what I'm talking about. It's okay. Okay. All right. Well, good, because I want to tell you about it. In 1949, this took place just off the isle, island of Scotland, just off of the coast of Scotland, at a place called the Island of Lewis, the Hebrides Islands. And living on that, that, that island, living on the island of Lewis, Hebrides Islands, were two women, interesting, women, that were 82 years, one, one, they're two sisters, their names were Peggy and Christine Smith. Their ages were 82 and 84. 82 and 84. Christine was, had crippling arthritis to the point that later she was completely bent over. Crippling arthritis. Peggy was completely blind. Two ladies, this is important, 82 and 84, living on this island of the Hebrides. Now watch. Here's what I found as I began to study them. One, one person said about them as I studied the history of it, that these two women of God were little known by man, but well known by God. Don't you want that for you? Little known by man, but well known by God. As I studied them, they said this of them. He said, they became greatly burdened because of the appalling state of their church, their parish. Because not a single young person attended their worship services or church. He said, they were greatly troubled by a growing trend of young people toward worldliness. It became, now listen to this good, listen to this good. It became clear that an outpouring of God's spirit in revival was the only hope to supernaturally reverse the situation. <clears throat> A verse gripped them. A verse gripped them. Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. That verse gripped these two women. Isaiah 44, 3, I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. So these two women, 82 and 84, took that one verse and they began to pray it. They began to pray that verse over their situation for their island, their church, their community, their nation. Two women in a dry place started praying. God, you promised that you would pour water on him that is thirsty and floods up on the dry ground. And when they began to pray that, something shifted. Do you know why? Because when you, be, when you pray the word of God, you pray the will of God. And when you pray the will of God, you can have whatever you ask for. Listen to me. This word right here is alive. But every promise in this book has to be activated by faith. This book can lay in your house and this book be closed and nothing come of it. But when you open this book, you can just take one verse out of it and change your family and change your city and impact a nation. It's the power of this word, this word has to be activated by faith. 
And it doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to have a big theologian degree. You don't have to be a big name. You don't have to know much. You don't even have to have a big education. You just got to have faith in the God who made the promise. Come on. You got to believe that the God who made the promise would keep it. This word is alive. Peggy and Christine took one verse and they determined what they would do. 82 and 84. I'm going to keep saying it. Because we need to be reminded we don't have an excuse. Come on, ladies. 82 and 84. They decided they weren't going to sit there and just wait for for their time to go home someday. They decided we're still breathing so we can do something. And we may can't do a lot, but we can pray. So Peggy and Christine decided our nation is in crisis. Nobody's coming to church. No young people's coming to church. So what they decided to do, start praying. And they decided this. We're going to pray. They determined a time. Two times a week. Tuesday night and Friday night. What? From 10 p.m., So 3 or 4 a.m. every Tuesday night and every Friday night. Did you get that? Tuesday night and Friday night, two times a week, Peggy and Christine made up their mind. We're going to pray from 10 p.m. to 3 to 4 a.m. every week, twice a week. For one thing, that God would pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon a dry ground. They were praying it. One night, off of the Holy Ghost, oh, now my. Oh, come on. One night, Peggy, the one that was blind, had a vision. (laughs) Of course. And Peggy has this vision. And in the vision, whoa, she sees, they, they said, the church of her fathers, packed to capacity with young people. And a strange minister standing in the pulpit. She was so gripped by the vision that history says she went to her pastor and told her pastor about it. And she went to her pastor and she shared with him what she had seen and the burden of her heart. And he took her message as a word from God to his heart. Turning to her, he said, what do you think we should do? What? She said, your pastor. Give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to waiting on God. Get your elders and deacons together and spend at least two nights a week waiting upon God in prayer. She asked him to call for the elders and she told them to go to a barn in the community If they would pray in the barn, she and Peggy would pray in the cottage at the same time. She asked her pastor, would you pray the same time we are, every Tuesday night and Friday night from 10 p.m. to 3 to 4 a.m. every morning? And she told her pastor, you pray there, we'll pray here. You pray there, we'll pray here. I believe I'm hearing a word from the Lord right now to the global church at large. Peggy and Christine and those ministers shared a common generation and a common word from the Lord. They shared the same generation that was in peril and in trouble. And rather by than just sitting and doing nothing and just waiting for Jesus to come someday, they decided, no, you know what we can do? We can pray. I just feel like that right now the Spirit of God is calling to the church in America and calling to the church in every nation of the world for the hour that we are living in and the peril of this generation. And he's calling to the church to prayer that we would move with such unity that we can say to the rock in Huntsville, Y'all pray here at the ramp in Hamilton. We'll pray there. Y'all pray in Huntsville. We'll pray in Hamilton. Come on. You pray here. We'll pray there. Whatever city you're in, whatever church you're in, you pray there. We'll pray here. To every nation, to every church, in every nation, every city of the world, to all the believers everywhere. Y'all pray there. We'll pray here. 
What happened? Those seven men in the barn, there were seven of them, the pastor and the elders, they were praying at the same time Peggy and Christine were. History tells us that this continued for weeks that turned to months. In fact, they said after three months of this long praying, three months, twice a week, seven, about six, seven hours a time, nothing happened. Nothing was happening. They continued to pray. These seven men, men there, Peggy and Christina, praying the same thing, Isaiah 44, 3. You promised. You promised. You promised. You would pour water on him that is thirsty. We're thirsty. You promised you would pour floods on the dry ground. Our land, our nation is so dry. God. One night, one of the elders, they said it was a young elder, began to pray. Psalms 24, after months of prayer. They said that he was praying, you know, the same, the verses, who will ascend the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. And this is what history said happened. They said the man stopped, and he looked at the other elders in the barn, and he said this. He said, quote, It seems to me to be so much humbug, to be waiting as we are waiting, praying as we are praying, when we ourselves, are not rightly related to God. <laughs> then he stopped, and they said he went like this. God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And they said before he could finish the verse, he was slain in the spirit. And this is what they said happened. They said in that moment, Something happened in the barn at that moment and in that young deacon. There was a power loosed that shook the heavens because the bowls of intercession had just tipped over. Come on. Oh! With that prayer, with that acceptance of the call to repentance from his own heart, the bowls of intercession. That was the moment after months and months of praying with Peggy and Christine, the seven men in the barn. Here's what they said. When that happened, hold on, my high. When that happened, would you get my shoes there in the car on the driver's passenger seat floorboard? I'm over these hills. When that, watch. Oh. Look. Look. We've got the deacon on the ground. He is in a slain the spirit. I love this part. Watch. When that happened, oh, I love this. Woo, watch. The power of God swept into the community, and an awareness of God gripped the community as had not been seen in more than 100 years. They said the next day, the looms were silent. Little work was done on the farms as men and women gave themselves to thinking rightly about eternal realities. Duncan Campbell went on to say later, an awareness of God, that is revival. We're just talking. Can I, I've, I've got, listen, on the way here, I was reading this. I've been so about this. I read this, what Duncan Campbell was the young man that eventually went back, and he was the one that, you know, the man, the vision that she said a strange minister was standing in the pulpit? Duncan Campbell was the young man that eventually they found after the revival had just broken out. So they went to a town, long story short, found Duncan Campbell. He came back. And he led that revival. It was a revival that shook their nation for four years. Thousands, tens of thousands of people were saved and swept into the kingdom of God. Why? Two women were not willing to sit there and be content. Come on, with a nation in peril. Two women, 82 and 84, blind and crippled, said, that why should we sit here till we die? Come on, why should we sit here till we die? They said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to do, I'm going to do something about it. <laughs> Two women birthed the revival. Put their pictures up for me of Peggy and Christine, my little Hebrides women. The, 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 that's the original picture. Right there is Peggy and Christine. 
Just leave it up a minute. And there's Duncan Campbell. That's the man that they found that led that revival for the next four years. Yeah. Say no excuses. No excuses. Here's what Duncan Campbell. Peer, uh, this was so, this was so interesting to me. What he said. Watch. Watch. Duncan Campbell said this about what revival is. I love this. Watch. Duncan Campbell said later, he said, let me tell you what I mean by revival. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh. He said, an evangelistic campaign or special meeting is not revival. He said, a successful evangelistic campaign or crusade in, in one, in a, in, a, in a successful evangelistic campaign or crusade, there'll be hundreds or even thousands of people making decisions for Jesus Christ. Watch. But the community remains untouched. And the churches continue much the same as before the outreach. But in revival, God moves in the district or like the whole community. He says, suddenly the community becomes God conscious. The Spirit of God grips men and women in such a way that even work is given up as people give themselves to waiting upon God. In the midst of the Lewis or the Hebrides awakening, the parish or the church minister at Bar Barbas wrote, The Spirit of the Lord was resting wonderfully on the townships or the counties of the region. His presence was in the homes of the people, on the meadow, in the moorland, and even on the public roads. This presence of God is the supreme characteristic of a God-sent revival. The presence of God. The presence of God is the supreme characteristic of a God-sent revival of the hundreds who found Jesus Christ during this time of fully, he said, fully 75% were saved before they even got to the meeting or heard a sermon by myself or any ministers of the church. The power of God and the Spirit of God was moving in operation and the fear of God gripped the souls of men. This is a God-sent revival as distinct from the special efforts of fields evangelism. In other words, what happens in a true move of God is when Huntsville, y'all are in here praying, Y'all are in here worshiping or whatever city you're from. Y'all are just seeking God, fasting, and praying. And all of a sudden, all of Huntsville and Madison and, and, and into Tennessee, all this region, just whoo, the heavens open. And God sits down. Suddenly people wake up from their beds in the middle of the night, miserable in sin, getting up. That's what happened in that city in the Hebrides. They said men and women that were already in bed woke up in the night, gripped by conviction. There was no social media. There was no radio to tell them where to go. The Spirit of God just got them up out of bed. And they said, I know a church that's over there. Come on. And they said when Duncan Campbell came, the first night of the revival, he got to the church. And at 10 o'clock that night, just from Peggy and Christine praying and seven men praying, when they opened the doors to the church, over 600 people had just come from their homes standing in their yards nobody had even said there's a revival over here the spirit of God said oh you need God go to the church what if God could grip America come on what if God what if God could grip this nation with such a move of his spirit Why does their story relate to us? Why? Why does the story of Peggy and Christine, why would I even bring this up this morning? Well, I have a reason. <laughs> because our children, our grandchildren, yes. our families, yes. our cities, our nation is in trouble. And just like Peggy and Christine, I'm going to quote what they said. It has become abundantly clear, yes, to you and me, that an outpouring of God's spirit in revival is the only hope to supernaturally reverse the situation in our nation. 
And like Peggy and Christine, you and I have some decisions to make. We can sit here till we die. Or we can get up and do something about it. Like Peggy and Christine, you and I have this system. Yeah, you and me. We. We, you, me. And why did I pull you into this? <laughs> because your time has come, Esther. Your time has come. God spoke to me sometime back, about a, probably about a year or two ago now. And he said, in this season of your life right now that you're entering into, he said, I'm going to send you to certain places. And when you get to those places, I'm, I'm sending you to these places to find Esther. He said, I'm sending you in the spirit, the heart of Mordecai. He said, I'm going to send you, Karen, in the heart of Mordecai. He said, I need you to go find Esther. So I came to Huntsville to say, Esther, are you here? Esther, your nation's in trouble. Esther, your family's in trouble. Esther, are you in Huntsville, Alabama this morning? Esther, are you? Esther, don't you get too comfortable in your palace. Come on, Esther. You, you've got to hear me. I feel like what Mordecai told Esther in Esther 4. Mordecai looks at Esther and he says, Esther, if you keep quiet at a time like this, Deliverance from the Jews will come from some other place. But Esther, you and your family will be lost. And then he says these words, but who knows? Perhaps. Who knows, Esther? Perhaps you were born. For such a time as this. Who knows? Perhaps. You were born for 2023. Who knows? Perhaps. Oh, that, that call awakened Esther. You know what she did? Esther made up her mind. When she heard the call of Mordecai, she made up her mind, the saving of my nation may cost me my life. But if I die, I die. Esther answered that call. And it's amazing to me how for Esther, everything was hinging on her response to that window of perhaps, her window of opportunity, her moment of time. And believe me, when listen to me, when you hit those perhaps moments, believe me, there is only a short window of time. She even had a date set for the destruction of her people. It was barreling toward them. The plan of the enemy was barreling toward her nation to destroy her nation. There was a short window of time. And Esther, if you'll grab this window when you've got it, you've got a perhaps moment, and you can change everything by your response to this call that you're being given right now. And Esther, if you say no, yes, God will keep his promise and eventually save his people. But Esther... Do you hear me? That if you miss this moment, you and your children and your grandchildren will perish to this culture and to the deception of the enemy in this hour. We just need to really hear this because we're in a moment and that window's closing and if God cannot ignore the sin of his people for their idolatry how can God ignore the sin of 60 million aborted children from just one nation 
in my lifetime, in my lifetime, 60 million. Does he turn his head and ignore it? No, he has set a law in motion. The wages of sin is death, and judgment is barreling headlong. And God has stepped into the church in this hour in a moment of mercy in a cracked window and said, there's just a little bit more time. Will you return to me with fasting and prayer? Will you call on me? And I've come to Huntsville today to say, come on, Huntsville. You pray here. We'll pray there. Oh, Esther heard her call. She said, I'll do something. Yes, Mordecai. Here's what we're going to do. Esther said, here's the plan. Mordecai, you get the people of God together. You pray and you fast for three days. I'm getting ready to do this, Mordecai. In other words, Esther's plan, we'll pray here, y'all pray there. You pray here. We'll pray there. Come on. You pray. We'll pray here. You pray there, Mordecai. That is the plan of God for this hour. When God's people unite together for the call of the hour, I believe something can happen because that's what happened for Peggy and Christine. When Peggy and Christine prayed, God stepped in. When Mordecai and Esther and God's people began to pray, they, she prayed in the palace. They prayed in their homes. But when God happened for Esther and Mordecai, you know what? God stepped in and the enemy of Israel was hung on his own gallows. What happened for Israel? The enemies of their nation was fully exposed and the plan of the enemy to destroy God's people ultimately returned and destroyed the enemy. What do you think? What do you think, y'all? Are we in? No, it's weighty. It's costly. Saving of a nation has never been cheap. Nor has one soul. Saving of just one. Ask Jesus. Never cheap. Ask Peggy and Christine. They probably didn't feel like praying from 10 to 4. Just their love for a nation overtook what they felt. You know what? Peggy and Christine taught us and Esther taught us. When you cry out to God, he comes. They remind me of the women in Jeremiah 31. Peggy Christine. Well, thank you, Holy Ghost. I just opened straight to it. I love it when that happens. <laughs> Hallelujah. Peggy and Christine and Esther say, I'm listening. Remind me of this. Jeremiah 31, 15. A cry is heard in Ramah. Deep anguish and bitter weeping. Rahel weeping for her children. Refusing to be comforted for her children are gone. Watch this. But now this is what the Lord says. Do not weep any longer for I will reward you. Mm -hmm. Your children will come back to you from the land of the enemy. Does anybody want to take that verse this morning? Your children will come back to you from the land of the enemy. I just feel like to say this. Your daughter that has been deceived about her identity. I feel the Lord telling me to tell you, your daughter is coming back to you from the land of deception and the land of the enemy. Keep praying, mother. She's coming back. Verse 17. There is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children will come again to their own border. Honey, if I were you, if I needed that one, I might stand up and run around the room. I, I'm telling you right now, the Lord is saying your children will come back to their own border. Your children, I'm going to run for somebody that won't. Your children will come back from there. Come on, your children will, my children, my children will come back. My children will come back to their own border. Hey! Come on, go, 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 go. Come on, some mothers desperate. Take that. My children will come back from the land of the enemy. My children will come back. Come on, mother. 
Don't stop. Come on. I need some mothers to help the rest of them. Come on. I need some mothers to help the rest of them. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Shout it. My children will come back to their own border. Would you give the Lord praise and help these women stand? Come on! Say, my children is coming back from the land of the enemy. Now give God praise one more time. Now you can keep marching, you can keep running, the rest of, I'm nearly done anyway. Hallelujah. I tell you what, when my daughter was gone as a prodigal, I'm like y'all. I about lost, I, I did, you get where you don't care what anybody thinks. It's like having a baby. You hit about that eight, nine, mm -hmm, eight, about seven, eight, nine, you don't care what anybody thinks whatsoever in the hospital or anywhere else. Just get what's in me out. Just get it out. And some of you need to have that attitude this morning. I don't care what she thinks, he thinks, they just get this thing through me. Get this thing. Get this miracle. Get this thing through me. I've made up my mind. You may be seated. I'm nearly done, but let me wrap it right here. Shout, I'm listening. Christina, Peggy, Esther, you. There's two keys in that passage. I can tell you quick what they are. And these, whoa, I feel the Holy Ghost. There's two keys in this passage right here. And it will bring a prodigal son home. It'll bring a prodigal daughter home. It'll bring a prodigal nation home. If there's some intercessors, that'll hear it and do it. A, first of all, here's the first key. A voice was heard. That's come on, a voice was heard. I don't care for the rest of this message. If this hits you, take off and just run or walk. I don't care. We've come to accomplish something this morning, and we're going to accomplish it. The first key, a voice was heard. That's the first key, and I know you've been praying, but pray again. I drove to Huntsville to tell you from the Lord. You prayed, pray again. First key to their deliverance, a voice was heard. Who's yours? God wasn't waiting on the young people in the Hebrides to cry out. He just needed Peggy and Christine. He just needs somebody. He just needs a one. It doesn't matter who it is. A voice is heard. First of all, it's you. You, you do your part first. God says it like this, Jeremiah 33, 3. You call on me and I will answer. God says you seek, you'll find. You ask, you receive. Watch. You knock your part. It'll be open, his part. In other words, God's saying, you do your part, I'll do my part. You do the possible, I'll do the impossible. If, I, if my people will, I will. Do you hear that this morning? The voice is heard. Heard. Rahel weeping because that's what intercessors do. Don't, don't pray pretty when your family's in trouble. This ain't that time. And right now, God's needing some intercessors that won't just sit around and pray. A coffee prayers are nice. I do them too sometimes. But whenever you're in warfare, you need to learn how to just pray and where you don't care what it sounds like, looks like, how long it takes. Come on, God's got to have some intercessors that can get this thing through in the spirit. Number two, first of all, the voice was heard. Number two, here's your second key, last part. Second key, that passage, to bring prodigals home. A nation, a prodigal nation home. Here it is. And your son, your daughter, your husband. This is, what, this is one of the most important ones. First, first most important is pray. Second one, this is huge. In Jeremiah 31, they refuse to be comforted. Rahel, weeping for her children. 
That's huge right there. It says it. Rahel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because her children are gone. Do you hear me today? You're going to see a miracle with your family, with your marriage, with children, or even with this nation. We're going to have to make up our mind today like those other people have done before us. We're going to have to make up our mind. We're going to pray, and we're going to refuse to be comforted because I can assure you this, there are comforters that abound. Comforters abound. Yes, they do. Comforters abound. People that will try to talk you out of it. People that will tell you, you know, you just need to not worry about this. Now, I'm not causing, calling y'all for no reason. Just bear with me. Come here. I need you two. Come here, sweetheart. No, just both of you. Yes, sweetheart, you two. I'll come get you. I need both of you. Come here. Now, I ain't pulling y'all up here because y'all are as old as Peggy and Christine. But I'm just... They're sisters. I didn't know that. See there? Didn't know them. Didn't know they were sisters because it's the Holy Ghost. I just needed a Peggy and a Christine. I was looking for a Peggy and a Christine. Yep. What about God? Sisters? Woo. I need, because Peggy and Christine could have and probably did have comforters. Now, Peggy, sweetheart, you know your condition you don't need to be praying that many hours like that, that long at your age because it's a little hard on you and on your body. And, and everybody knows, uh, Peggy, you know, with your vision and everything, God understands. He, he'll call somebody, but Peg, not you, Peggy. Christine, honey, listen, you, you, this arthritis has been bothering you. You don't need to be kneeling. You know that. Chris, you don't have to do that, Christine. It's a little excessive. Six hours twice a week. It's a little much. And you know what, girls? God didn't call y'all to take on a whole nation. You know, y'all need to take care of you. You, gotta, you just need to be concerned for you. It's all right. Y'all don't need to go so extreme. That's a little extreme, girls. Y'all, that's a little bit much. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy and Christine. Thank y'all very much for coming and helping me. <laughs> Esther. Come here, Esther. Now, Esther. Sweetheart, I know that what Mordecai told you and everything, and you heard about the news, but Esther, I think your reaction to that's a little bit much. And it's, it's Esther, here's the deal, sweetheart. That's a bit risky. What you're planning to do, I heard what you were planning to do. And listen, I was talking to some other family members of yours, and you need to hear them. See, Esther, this is a national problem. Way too big for you. Esther, it's already a law. And Esther, you know laws can't be changed. It's already a law. And you can't really do anything about national problems like that. It's way too big, sweetheart. So Esther, you just, you know, probably God put you in that palace to just enjoy it. I mean, you're in a beautiful place. You need to just stay right where you are. Okay? And, and you just do and enjoy where God's put you. Let, let somebody else handle that, Esther. It's okay. And, and now listen, prodigal uh, mother that's praying for a prodigal right now. now. Now listen, I want her to represent you. How many of you is praying for a prodigal loved one? Mm -hmm, okay. How many of you are praying for a son or a daughter prodigal? Raise your hand, a grandchild. Okay. Let her, Pam is y'all. She's you right now. Now honey, listen. I know I heard about your, your son. But that's what boys do at that age. And so he's in college or, you know, high school. All boys do that kind of thing. You don't need to carry that, honey. It's just too much. And so we, we've got our little prayer group, and we're going to mention his name when we do our prayer list. It's every day. You're, you're doing too much. It's too much. And listen, I heard about your daughter and everything. She's going to grow out of it. Don't worry about it. I heard about that, that confusion she's going through with her identity and everything. It's, it's all right, sweetheart. And it's just our culture. And you know what? You might just need to accept it as it is. And just accept her as she is. Listen, honey, you let her be her because I've heard that they think you're trying to control. And, you know, I've heard you're a little bit controlling. So what you need to do <laughs> is you just accept it because she's an adult and you can't force her to make those decisions. No. Come on. No, you know what you got to do? You got to look every comforter in the eye and say, you know what? 
I've already got a word from God, and I've already made up my mind. I've already made up my mind. I refuse to be comforted. This culture will not talk me out of it. Come on. Nobody, no family, not even some church members, nobody is going to talk me out of the promise God gave me to bring them home. I refuse to be comforted. Shall I refuse to be comforted? Say, if I die, I die. But I'll die believing it. I want you to shout it out. Say, I believe it. Don't shout it pretty. Shout it with everything you got. That's so much better. I'm just keeping on trying to be done. I promise I nearly am. There's only one concern I have. I've heard about, come on, we hear all the other opinions of everybody. You've got to make up your mind. There's only one opinion that, you could, that you're really concerned about. Say so there's one opinion that really matters. I need one more. I need, I need one more. I need one more. Sweet baby girl, come here, doll. Come up here all the way. I want this beautiful doll to represent your loved one, all right? Even if it's a boy or girl, whoever, even, even a spouse, I just want her to represent the one you are believing for, all right? Yeah, I believe this morning the Lord brought you here. Because this weekend, remember when he's, he's presenting a call on a national global level, but also he's presenting a call to you for your family. How does revival start to a nation? starts with you and your family. I believe the Lord brought you here this morning to take a good look at your children. Mother, grandmother, your grandchildren, your husband. You take, a, you take a good look at them. The Lord brought you here this morning just to take a real good, and ask yourself some very important questions. How is she doing spiritually? She may be doing good in school and Maybe having good grades. She may be a cheerleader, maybe a football player. He may, be, he may have all this stuff. But how is she doing with God? Where's her walk with God? I think today you may need to ask yourself some questions about your children, about your family, you know, about your, even your husband. He's got money. He's got a good. But how is he doing with God? Where's my daughter at? She may look the part and even go to church on Sunday, have a part of the youth group. But how is she really, is she burning for God? And you need to really look at your, good, your heart and say, is she okay? Because what happens is sometimes, bring me something, bring me a chain. You may look at your daughter and you say it like this. Bring it to me, Annalise, quick. I believe today some of your kids, maybe it's your daughter, maybe it's your son. And sweetheart, I'm sorry these are heavy, but they are. But sin is heavy. may look at this, you're looking at the addiction, the chains of addiction, of drug addiction. Maybe you're looking at chains of pornography on your children or your husband or your family. Maybe today you're looking at the chains of alcoholism. You're looking at the chains of sexual perversion in their mind that's gripping this generation and stealing their identity and their gender, who God made them. Maybe you're looking at the lies of the enemy and it's wrapped all around and it's consuming their life, and it's consuming their mind. And mother and grandmother, you got to look at that and say, is that okay? No. Then you got to look at it and say this, am I okay with this? Because the world will tell you to be. And you've got to ask yourself the most important question of all. God, I've heard what everybody else has said about her. But here's your most important question. God, are you okay with this? I don't care what the culture says is okay. I don't even care what all the church is trying to say okay. God, are you okay with this bondage? Because when I look at her, God, I'm seeing everything the enemy does, stealing, killing, and destroying. God, you can't be okay with that. And you've got to ask yourself today, if he's not okay with it, am I okay with it? But let me tell you something. When you start praying and you start seeking God and asking him some questions, I'm going to tell you some good news. Your voice cries out, you get God involved. Rusty, come here. I need God. 
I need you to be God. I should say Pastor Rusty. I'm sorry, Bishop. I should say that. I'm sorry. He's Rusty to me, but you know what I mean. Rusty, just stand here and be God. I know it's big shoes, but you can do it. Big shoes. And I need you to look at this. Now then, I've been praying. Now I've got God involved. You start praying, God's going to get involved. That's why he said, you call on me, I'll answer. You start calling on me about your daughter, about your son, your husband. I'm, I'm coming. You call, I'm coming. You get God involved, and you know what? He's right here. Now, what happens? God loves her more than you do. God loves him more than you do. He's just been waiting on a call. And here's the deal. When you call on him, he ain't going to step out of heaven and put skin on. He's already done that. He's already done that. What does he do? It's Ezekiel 22, 30. I searched for a man. I'm needing somebody. God is saying because my hand of mercy is extended, but there's a gap. There's a gap. I love her. I want to reach her. I've died for her. I poured out my blood for her. I can't reach her. There's a gap. Come on, there's something between us. And what does God do? He ain't coming in person again. He's looking for a man. I need somebody. I got to find an intercessor. Somebody to stand in the gap. Take my elbow, baby. Standing in the gap. This is who you are. This is what you're called to do. This is why you came to this conference. This is what God is calling you to be this morning. He's calling you to say yes I'll stand in the gap this is who you stand up all over this room I want the band to come this is who you are mother this is who you are grandmother so you are a praying wife I'm standing in the gap somebody that's made up their mind I'm not moving I'm not moving Come on, all God needs is somebody that can stand right here and believe that his word is stronger than their lie. That his blood is stronger than their bondage. Somebody that's going to make up their mind. I'm not moving. I'm not moving. I'm not giving up my post. I'm not giving up my place. I refuse to be comforted. Somebody that can take the hand of God, of mercy, and reach out to those that in the natural are destined for judgment. Somebody that can hear the voice of God because she can't. What does a praying mother do? Praying wife, praying grandma, I'll tell you what they do. Rusty, pretend like you're talking to me. Pretend like you're talking. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I hear you, Lord. Hang on, baby. Hang on. Hang on. Okay, I hear you, God. Then that intercessor turns around and goes, Thus says the Lord. <laughs> the captive of the warrior will be released. The plunderer of the tyrant will be retrieved. I will fight those that fight you, and I will save your children. What does the intercessor do? Pretend like you're talking to me. Okay, yeah. Thus says the Lord. Hold my arm. Thus says the Lord. You will know the truth, and the truth is going to set you free. Come on! This is why the enemy's fought you so hard, Mother. It's why the enemy's tried so hard to get you distracted by things that don't matter. The, all the enemy wants to do is make you give up. And sometimes the enemy will cause them to say things to you that hurts you so bad. It hurts so bad that you just want to let them go. All right, then just go live your life. I can't, I can't keep hoping because it hurts to hope. I just, I let them go like everybody's telling me to do. And I'm telling you, if you give up your hope, you've given up your faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the only way to please God, the only hope they have is for you to hold on to hope in, the, in spite of impossibility. 
when it hurts, when you feel like you're dying, when it hurts so bad, you can't hardly stand it. You hang on. Come on. I'm never letting her go. I'm never letting her go. She may go in the natural, but I'll never go and let her go in the spirit. Sometimes in the natural, you have to let them go. And love lets go. Well, hold on, baby. Love lets go, but faith holds on. Sometimes it's required to love. You have to let them go. But in faith, you never let them go. I want you to get up here today if you've got to have a miracle. I know we're crowded and don't have room. Just get up here today if you're, if you're the one that's got to have the strength to stand in the gap. Even if you're just going to stand in the back of the aisle, I don't care. Make an effort to move. Just make an effort to move. I know we're way, we will not have enough room. I don't care if you just got to stand. If you got to take two steps and stand. Just want you to make it. Just stand up, sweetheart. Just stand right up here. We're going to pray. I want you to look at me as you're coming. And I know many of you are just in the aisles, and I get that. The rest of you will just stay up here. Lisa, come, sweet baby. If those of you that are in the, in the aisles, just, just I know the Lord has seen your effort, and that's what matters. Even if you can't get close to up here, it doesn't matter. He's seen you. He saw you move. Sometimes it's just the effort to be willing to move. Hold on one more time. Those of you that have come or are coming, I want you to look at me. This, look at me, honey. This is what your battle lately has been about. You understand? And I want to tell you, the last thing I'm going to tell you on this, we're going to pray. Look at me, I'll tell you the last. I feel to tell you this. Don't be surprised or give up if when you take this position, she gets worse. Hold on, baby. She gets worse. That's usually the way it works. Do not get moved by what she looks like. The only thing that moves you, I love Psalms that says, I tremble only at your word. I'm not going to tremble in fear when I look at her and what she just told me she was going to do and where she told me she was going to move and how she told me she was going to live and what he just said. I'm not going to be moved, but that does not move me. Listen, you're the most, you're the greatest threat to the enemy. When what they say quits moving you. Now, it hurts. I'm not saying it won't hurt. I'm not saying you won't cry. You'll cry hard. But you don't have to move. Just because you cry or hurt doesn't mean you've got to move. You stay. Because here's the deal, sweetheart. The whole plan of what you've been going through lately is to get you to do this right here. Or sometimes, like I said, it's, it's, you'll hang on to him, but you'll let them go. That's the whole plan of the enemy. He'll do any. He knows he's already lost you to, to God. He knows that your, your threat to him now is her. It's him. It's a nation. This is his whole goal to discourage you this week. And I heard the Lord say, when you're looking at them and it gets worse, if you do this, that's what you're going to believe. You're going to have to, when she gets worse, you keep holding on. But the Lord just says, you look at me. When he gets worse, the Lord says, you look at me. You look at me. And when he gets worse, when she gets worse, you just turn around. You hang on to him, but you keep looking at him. Now, thank you, sweetheart. Rusty, stay up here, Lisa. Raise up your hands. Just listen. I want to pray for you right now first. I pray that you are strengthened to stand. I pray you have renewed strength in your body where the enemies fought you with physical, even physical fatigue and complete exhaustion and the drain. I pray you have strength to fight on your knees. 
I pray in Jesus' name you have renewed faith to fight with. I pray that you have ears that are open to hear the voice of God again. I pray right now this cold numbness is going to just melt away by the wind of God that's going to let you feel again and love again. Somebody, I hear that right now. Somebody's been so hurt. You've just let yourself go numb because you can't take the hurt of what they've said. It hurts too bad. And the Lord says, I'm here. I'm going to heal your broken heart. Oh, come on, honey. Take that right now. The Lord's here to heal that pain. He's here to heal what they said. It went deep, but God's healing what they said. And the Lord said to tell you it wasn't true. It's a lie. Don't believe the lie. It was a lie. It was a lie what they said to you about you. And the Lord says, don't believe. Don't believe the liar. He's saying, believe who I say you are. And you've been misunderstood by family. And you've been misunderstood by church people. And you've been misunderstood by friends. But the Lord says, it doesn't matter. I understand. And you said yes. And I need you. Come on, that's all that matters is that he understands your heart. I pray strength in you to fight. I pray strength in you to not be moved by what you see or what you've heard. Oh, I pray right now, God, wash away the pain. I just see it right there. Wash it away. Lord, even wash away the memory of it. I pray you'd wash away the sting of it's leaving you right now. Whoa, I hear the, whoa, I hear the Lord saying the word you gave earlier was to her. I will do in a moment what would have taken 20 years of counseling. That was your word. Come on, come on. Some people say, oh, you need to go to counseling for that. God said, I'm doing it right now and it's going to take about a moment. Come on, right now. He's doing it now. He's healing it now. He's healing it now. He's healing it now. He's healing it now. now. Peace come, fear go, anxiety go. I declare that tension in your mind is leaving. I, de I declare that demonic torment is going. I declare those sleepless nights are over. I declare rest, I declare peace, I declare strength in you, in Jesus' name. Just breathe that in right there, Woo, hallelujah. One more thing. I want you to hold out one hand. Give me, give me your right hand right there. Just give me your right hand. All right? You can hold out your right hand. Now, hold out your left hand. All right, right there. Go there. Now, I want you to take their name, the names of those that you're believing for. Maybe more than one. That's fine. I want you to put those names in your hand. Just see yourself putting their names. There they are right there. I've got some, too. I'm, lift, I'm putting them in my hand. And in just a moment, I'm going to have you to lift your hands in a moment. And when I count to three, and then when I do that, I want you to let them go to God. I want you just to give them again because we do it again and again every day, giving them to God. And whenever you give them to God, I want you to supernaturally grab with your right hand the hand of God. And with your left hand, I want you to grab a hold of them. And this is going to be a declaration of your position that you're not moving from. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Lift them up. Come on. Grab the hand of God and grab their hand. Come on, right now. Standing in the gap. Standing in the gap. Standing in the gap. Come on, mother. You are the
Here's something that we have to remember about God is that his faithfulness endures. The scripture says it endures throughout what? All generations. His faithfulness endures. Where does the hiccup with the faith end up with? Where, where does the wall come in? Who said us? It's us. In the German translation of Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says faith is a substance of things that we hope for. It's what? Of what we what? We can't see it. The German translation says faith is heaven's unseen reality. And let me explain what that what what you just saw right here was when he was calling out for a man. Do you know who the man is? Did you figure that out? That's us. But guess where he, he's already sent the man, but guess where our fight is? Your fight is not with people. Your fight is not with your unsaved husband. Your fight is not with the spirit that's controlling your daughter or your son. You cannot fight this kind of a battle right here. You have to take it into the courts of heaven. You take it into the courts of heaven and you stand before a righteous judge and you grab that hand and you say, you know what? I'm stepping in to heaven because heaven's already seen it. Heaven's already declared it. Jesus has already died. He has already declared the salvation of your son, your daughter, your family member. He's faithful. We have to shake ourselves no matter what things look like. And I just want to ask this question. When she was this unbelievable word that was presented today. Many of you in this room today remember the message that she preached about eight years ago. Some of you have it tattooed on your body. You, who said it? You pray until. You pray. You pray. Until you don't stop and you do not let a text message, what you see, what you don't see. Look, we get it all up in our head. We think God needs us and we think it needs to happen this way. And if he would just do it this way, no, you're not God. And guess what? He doesn't need you to do anything. But step into the courts of heaven and come into agreement with what he has already said, with what he has already done. It's that simple. It's that simple. You know why? She's not just preaching a good message. She lived this. She lived this with her own child. This message was birthed out of a mom who absolutely rent the heavens until she saw her miracle. Amen. Let that stir you to like, let it shake you today. This message was birthed out of a mom who did the very thing that every one of you in this room will see in the name of Jesus. So before you step away, I want her to come back. I want you to tell her about your book. Tell her about Lindsay's book, too. They need to get both of them. <laughs> they, there, uh, are, there's three books at the table that I believe will really bless you. 
whenever Lindsay was gone and when she came back, I ever never dreamed in my life that I would even walk through it, much less write a book about it. But the book, some of you have it, it's called Watching the Road because that's what intercessors do. And the book is my is the journey that I took of intercession while she was gone. And it's the, it's the things that the Lord taught me about prayer. I've never known a season of the nearness of God like that in my whole life or how clearly he speaks. And the point of it is I want to encourage you that you can hear God in supernatural, unusual ways. He'll start talking to you. He's going to blow your mind. And you're going to use that word until they get back. Or it's not just about prodigals. It's about for anything impossible. It may be healing in your body. It, it's, it's for anything. It may be financial, mountain. It's for anything that's impossible. These prayer strategies, strategies, I believe, will help you. When Lindsay did come home, thank you, God, she, after a few years of intercession, but after a few years, she came home. And when she got home, she wrote a book on her story of how God could take a girl that uh, was raised in the ministry and church and could deceive her drop by drop. She had known nothing but the Lord, and yet she just became a different person for a few years. And so she just pulls the curtain on the enemy and tells her story and how she made her way back home. And I, I think it will help you understand your prodigal more to read that book, or even just someone going through a difficult marriage or whatever. Now, my, the third book my oldest daughter wrote called Goodbye Girl, Hello Lady, that's a book for every it's the, it's the book every mother and grandmother would want to give their daughters, all right, to be a godly woman, how to have relationships, how to walk in uh, overcoming fear, how to dress as a godly woman. Don't our girls need that? And so, but it's all, it's just many, many things that have to do with young ladies. It's the book you would want your daughter to read, I can tell you that. The last thing is, I've got a, there's several things in there that would all bless you at the table. You can go look at it. One last thing I want to take the table that I designed especially for you, and that is this. Oh, wait, there's prodigal letters back there. When Lindsay got home, she wrote three letters that I think will help you. And those letters, I call them letters from the pig pen. And it's the letter that if you're prodigal, whoever they are, wherever they are, could tell you the truth of what they're feeling. They can't because they're, they're, there's a grid that right now everything's going through. So lies are coming out. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm happier than I've ever been. All that garbage. Now, if they could tell you the truth of what they're really feeling when they lay down at night and the lights go out and you've always wondered, do you miss me? All those kind of things. Do you miss? Do you miss your family? All that kind of stuff. These three letters that she wrote are to you from them if they could tell you the truth. Those are back there. And the last thing is called, I call them my hidden message hoodies. And, and you'll know what they are when you see them. I just put a little symbol, like one of them has a crown. One of them has a tree. Oh, good. And this is that. Because when Lindsay was gone and she would come over, because she, she was raised in the church, she knows me and she knows my lingo. So I couldn't be blatant because she would, you know, I roll whatever, mom. You know that thing? So I had to go and code. So what it was, I, I had little signs around the house to encourage me. When she said stupid, horrible stuff, I would just look over there at my little signs. I'd left myself. She didn't know what they meant, but I did. So I made you a shirt. So when you're with your family, one of them's got a tree back there. And see, your loved one just sees the tree. They think, oh, what a cute tree. When they say something stupid, look on the bottom of your sleeve on the wrist, and the wrist says, I will not be moved. Okay? This one, I got a word when she was gone. That's my word. I'm sharing it with you. This one has a crown, and so you wear that, and they'll think, what a cute crown. And then when something awful happens, you just look down at your sleeve at the restaurant, and it goes, when the battle's over, meaning I will wear the crown, meaning I've got victory. So anyway, those will be back there. Amazing. Can you put your hands together one more time and thank Karen? Wow. Wow. It's so hard to transition a moment like this because you just want to stay here. Oh, of course. No, just one thing. You know, when you have an opportunity to be, have a front row seat of a miracle, what you've heard from this woman of God today, you see a contender in what she preached today. She lives. And watching the miracle, I personally in my life, I've never seen one quite like it. And um, 
I pray, Esthers, it's time. We need you. The church, rise up. Amen. I just want to say.